the first thing to think about when looking at a contract in front of you, um, whether you're the one beginning to draft it or having your solicitor or someone else draft it, or whether it's being presented to you and you're having to review it and understand what it means for you and your business, is you have to, have to think about your bargaining position. Because in principle, you know, almost all contracts are negotiable. And you shouldn't be ashamed or embarrassed uh, or afraid to try and negotiate uh, clauses and, and negotiate the contract to, uh, to be a better deal for you. However, it really all depends on your bargaining position. So if you're in a weak bargaining position, you're going to be able to get less out of the contract than if you're in a strong bargaining position. It's pretty obvious, really. But a lot of people will um, not realize that they're actually in a strong position, and therefore they won't try and seek um, uh, to lower the risk in the contract, to increase the, the service levels that they could get from the contract, and vice versa. Some people will end up not entering a business deal because they think they can wring um, uh, changes to the contract that really they're not going to get uh, because they're in, uh, they're in a poor bargaining position. So a lot of what we'll talk about today uh, uh, really depends on what your bargaining position is. When you first open the contract, I think it's probably good to just understand the, the flow of the contract. Usually the front end will be the legal part of the contract. It's where all the, uh, any regulations that need to be accounted for are put in, or all the sort of black letter law, the dry law, goes in the front. And often the commercial or um, uh, implementation side of the contract goes in the back. So that will be the appendices and the schedules and that sort of thing. One thing to quickly ascertain is, you know, does this thing uh, hold together or has someone basically just spliced two different contracts together or used an old front contract and just added in things in the back? Because the defined terms, those words often with a big letter at the front explaining what that term means, should be the same all the way through. And the back end should tie into the, the front end rather well. And it's a good indication that you've got a, a good or a poor contract, uh, a clear or not so clear contract. If you just look at those defined terms, often the definitions will be at the very front of the contract um, and they'll, they'll jump out of the page. Just flick through, have a look. Does it all make sense? Does it all tie up? And it will give you a good sense of what you're looking at. When we're talking about the purpose and the clarity of uh, a contract, in addition to how well it holds together and, and the defined terms. The most, important to start off, uh, the most important thing to start off with is probably obligations. Um, is the contract clear? Who's doing what? By when? For how much? Uh, and often you'll see con co contracts where you simply have um, suppliers' obligations on page two through page four, uh, and then the person receiving those supplies, their obligations on page five through page six. And it's quite a neat and tidy way of doing it. Um, but if those obligations and the scope of those obligations aren't clear, um, that's probably the first thing you need to start ascertaining. Because at the end of the day, the contract's really just about uh, two people intending to en enter into legal relationship, someone to do something for someone else, provide goods or service for someone else. And if you're not clear on the fundamentals about who's doing what, by when, and for how much, then all the rest of it begins to be a bit um, pointless. Um, moving on to price and payment, again, it's just one of those fundamentals, and it's just a great place to start when trying to break into a contract and understand what it's all about and the implications of the contract. You know, um, have you got a meeting of the minds as to how much is going to be paid? When will payment take place? Are there going to be chances of payments? Will there be triggers for payments? Um, will be, one payment be due, will, will a greater amount of payment be due at the front end of the contract or the back end of the contract? All of these things should be included in the contract and detailed uh, and set out very, very clearly because those are the areas that probably lead to the most. Um, uh, you see the disputes often come across your table and price and not being clear on what price and when price uh, is to be paid. Those are just really, really common problems that come up again and again. So make sure that's covered off at, at the front end of your um, review. If you, make, if you offer a warranty, you're essentially promising that something is true or that you're going to do something. So if you're putting warranties into a contract or you see warranties in a contract, they're very important because they're promises. And you have to be sure if you're giving warranties that you can honor those promises. Because if you don't, then you could be in breach uh, of the contract and you may be liable for damages. So um, another really important thing to start out paying attention to is uh, what warranties you being given, 
what warranties are you giving? And in conversations outside of the four corners of the contract, are there things that have been told to you, promises about uh, the kinds of services that, it, that you'll get, the kinds of machinery, the numbers of things that you'll get, the uh, quality of this, that, and the other? Uh, in those conversations, those promises that have been made, uh, should they be in the contract? If you're in doubt as to whether you can give uh, those promises and meet them, then you should really think seriously about whether you want to include them in the contract or not. Um, liability, um, we'll talk about that in a second, but that's probably another one of the top five issues. If you had nothing else in the contract, there are sort of top five things you'd want to cover, uh, and they would be things like uh, price and payment, um, uh, the liability, i.e. the risk that you're taking on in a contract, intellectual property rights, term and termination. So it's one of those sort of really top issues that we'll talk about on a separate slide in just a second. Time scales and delay, um, it's all very well knowing what you're going to do um, but, uh, and, and when you're going to do it by, but what happens if there's a delay? What happens if you can't get your shipment in and therefore you can't do what you promised to do uh, to someone upstream in the, in the contract chain? Really important to have thought through uh, all the delay problems that can occur in the business uh, that you're running um, and what the, remedy, what the remedies will be because... Um, People can have wildly different interpretations of what their obligations are if they're not spelt out, particularly when it comes to delay. Because, for example, they say, well, the reason I didn't de deliver that on time was because, and then it's, you know, excuse one, two, three, reason one, two, three. Uh, and those things need to be covered off either in a force majeure clause uh, that says they couldn't help that or in some other manner. But really, really pay attention to uh, what happens if uh, goods, the delivery of goods or the provision of services are delayed in some way. Intellectual property rights, the biggies really are copyright, uh, design rights, trademarks, that kind of thing, patents, absolutely. Um, and so, for example, just take a, uh, something that almost all of you will have been involved in at one point or another, and that's um, purchasing a website, maybe for your business. If you think about the intellectual property in a website, that's pretty much all there is. Uh, the value of a website really is its intellectual property. So whoever builds the website, who puts it together, um, they will automatically own the intellectual property, whether it be the, the look and feel of the website, the design of the website, how the source code has been uh, manipulated, the copyright embedded in uh, source code, copyright in any um, uh, text that goes on the website, copyright in photographs, um, domain name rights. So really, really important to understand uh, how important IPR is when you're dealing things with uh, with things like websites because often that's all the value that, that is involved. Um, and think about how it would impact on your business if come the time you may want to sell your business or have your business looked at uh, by prospective buyers, um, IPR is one of those areas that they will do a lot of due diligence on because you're saying, well, I'm selling a business of value and a lot of that business in the kind of economy that we all live in will be intellectual property. So if you, for example, have commissioned someone to build yourself a website, which is absolutely fundamental to uh, the way your business um, sells goods or services, and you're not sure if you actually own the intellectual property in that website, then the potential buyer will have a real problem and will really, really push you hard to try and get confirmatory assignments of uh, intellectual property, will really uh, try and um, get the price down on you if some of these things are left uh, undetermined. So usually if you're going to subcontract someone to, to build something like a website, you want it to be very, very clear, unless they're an employee, in which case there are some statutory um, uh, rights where uh, intellectual property automatically vests in the business that's employing them. You want to be very sure with subcontractors that when they um, provide a service to you, and you pay them for that service, that very expressly they are assigning, i.e. Uh, transferring ownership to you, and it doesn't sit with them. Because in that case, they may be licensing you to use their intellectual property. And if you go to sell your business and you're trying to sell uh, a, a product, a website that, that's licensed rather than your own, then uh, the price of that business, the value of that business goes way down and the risk of that business goes way up. So um, really think through the various intellectual property issues that may surround your, your business. 
as you go towards the back end of the contract, you'll tend to get more and more boilerplate. And these, these, these are important, you know, they're in there for a reason, um, but they're not necessarily always the most important clauses. Um, uh, but of those towards the back, those that are the most important would be uh, probably assignment clauses, governance, uh, and any other sort of unusual terms you might see there. Just starting off with assignment. Essentially, if you enter a business contract uh, with another party, um, they could down the line decide they want to sign, transfer that contract to someone else, to a, a group of people that you really may not want to do business with, either because you've had a, a run-in with them in the past, they're a competitor, uh, you don't like the individuals in, involved. Uh, but there'll be nothing stopping the other side uh, handing that or transferring that contract over, unless in your contract you've covered that point off. So usually you're going to want to make sure in your contract that if they do want to transfer the contract, uh, you'll be made aware of it and you'll have to give your consent before it can be transferred. Alternatively for yourself, of course, you want to keep as much flexibility as possible. So um, if, if uh, that point's not in there, you don't want to put it in there because you want to be able to assign, uh, transfer a contract um, if you want to without having to get their permission. So that's just one um, clause, usually towards the back end of the contract that you want to pay attention to. Uh, the same with governance. Usually it will break it down into two points. Uh, what law do you want governing this contract? And where's the jurisdiction that you will um, uh, fight it out in court if you need to? The law, for example, is usually England and Wales, but sometimes you'll see um, you know, US law. Same with jurisdiction. Sometimes you'll see US jurisdiction. jurisdiction. Um, often with uh, software or IT contracts, you'll see that because they've originated over in the States. And you want to do everything you can to try and get that change to English law because it can be a real problem if you do need to uh, enforce a contract, uh, interpret the contract. Uh, obviously, you may need to hire American lawyers or lawyers from some other part of the world. The cost, the impracticality, the time delays of doing that can really become a problem for you in uh, making that contract work for you. So do try and get a change to, to English law. And when you flick through to the back of the um, contract, that's one of those areas you really just need to let your eyes skim over and make sure it says English law, English courts.